Okay, I'll start our recording. It's moving along as it should. And we're coming up to, my clicker is not working so well here, but let's see if it'll uh, keep it going. It's like some, it's a radio uh, transmitter, but uh, uh, the radio transmission is going kaflui. <laughs> anyway, we're into the book of Matthew again. We're up to Matthew chapter 5, verses 33 to 37. Now, we're still in the Sermon on the Mount, and we're going to study today what Jesus felt very important to talk to the people about, and, of course, the Pharisees and the Sadducees who were watching and listening, and that is the value that God places on truth. Now, in Jesus' day, uh, truth was a very evasive thing. People commonly swore, they made oaths, they took vows to, to get people to believe what they had to say, and it was just used all the time in speech uh, for everyday use. And although God's law, according to Moses, took vows very seriously, uh, they became flippant uh, with their vows and uh, their swearing of oaths, and it had very little meaning. And as a result, truthfulness had essentially been lost to God's people, especially the religious leaders who should have known better, the scribes and the Pharisees. So it was time for Jesus to set the record straight. And this is what he did. And he told them what God expected of them from the Old Testament, which was, of course, the Bible for them at that day. But let's watch uh, the visual Bible. It's a short little clip uh, of this particular speech by Jesus. And I'll read it too because it is short enough. And then we'll have a moment of prayer. And we'll open it right up and see what we can learn from the principle, the perversion, and the pattern of truth. Here we go. Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but keep the oaths you have made to the Lord. Hmm? But I tell you, do not swear at all. Either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. Simply let your yes be yes and your no, no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. <clears throat> okay. And if you have your Bible, look at it again, you'll see it. Again, Jesus said, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oaths, or oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, Jesus said, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Verse 36, and do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Let's pray. Father God, help us to fully comprehend and understand the severity of Jesus' words and the importance that our speech is to have in our relationship with others, but particularly with the kingdom of heaven. And I pray that each and every one of us here might be those who speak the truth at all times. And if we haven't, Help us to learn what to do, how to do, and when to do it in ways that are pleasing in your sight. Now, Father, we also realize that when the Word of God is opened, it speaks to those who are believers and unbelievers. And if there's anyone under the sound of the Word today, wherever they might be, listening uh, on the Internet or even in the church facility, I don't know. If they don't know Jesus Christ as their Savior, I pray that the words of the Holy Spirit will speak to their heart and break down this sin of rebellion and rejection of all that God has said and call upon Jesus Christ like we have done to call upon him to be our Savior and our Lord. We pray for them that the Spirit of God would encourage and enact that. And for those of us who know you as Lord and Savior, may it be another uh, mo movement or a moment where we gain higher ground in our walk of faith. In Jesus' name we pray for all these things. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Some time ago, in the late, I guess it is 18th century, there was a theologian and a philosopher by the name of Immanuel Kant. Well, there was a story written about him. I don't know whether it's true or not. 
But the story is very relevant to what Jesus had to say. So I'm going to read what has been written about Immanuel Kant. When the well-known German philosopher Immanuel Kant was an old man, he made a perilous journey through the forest of Poland to his native country of Silesia. On the way, he encountered a band of robbers who demanded all his valuables. Finally, they asked, have you given us your all? Only when he answered, yes, I have given you all, did they let him go. Well, when he was safely out of their sight, his hand had touched something hard in the hem of his robe. And it was his gold that he had sown there for safety and quite forgotten about doing it in his fear and confusion when he was robbed. He was so terribly troubled by this that he had told a lie and had deceived. At once he hurried back to find the robbers. And having found them, he meekly said, and I quote, I have told you what was not true. It was unintentional. I was too terrified to think. Here, take the gold that was in my robe. I cannot keep it now, knowing I did not tell you the truth. Then to the old man's astonishment, nobody offered to take his gold. They were silent, and then something happened. The head robber was overcome with guilt, and he bowed his head, and he went back to uh, Kant and handed him the purse he had stolen. And seeing this, the others were overcome with guilt, and another robber restored Kant's valuable book of prayer, and still another more. Now all of them in tears led his horse toward him and helped him to mount. Together they asked the elder Kant for his forgiveness. Never had they met a man like this. And as they watched him slowly ride, ride away, the story tells us that they were forever changed by such a man, and they gave up robbery. Indeed, the value of truth had powerfully triumphed over evil. Now, as I said, that might be just a story, but here's one that is not a story, and it is recorded truth. It is the writings of Charles Lindbergh. Listen to what he has to say. I'm quoting, In my youth, science was more important to me than either man or God. I worshipped science. Its advance had surpassed man's wildest dreams. It took many years for me to discover that science, with all its brilliance, lights only a middle chapter of God's creation. However, I saw the invention of the aircraft, a thing of beauty that I loved. Although now it was in war, destroying the civilization, civilization I expected it to save. Now I understand that spiritual truth is more essential to a nation than the mortar in its city walls. For when the actions of a people are undergirded by truth, there is safety. When spiritual truths are rejected, Lindbergh said, it is only a matter of time before civilization will collapse. So we must understand God's spiritual truths and apply them to our modern life. We must draw strength from almost forgotten biblical virtues of simplicity, humility, contemplation and prayer, and above all, speaking truth. And he closed by saying this, Indeed, it requires a dedication beyond science, beyond self, but the re rewards are great, and it is our only hope for a nation. Well, I think Charles Lindbergh knew the value of truth, especially spiritual truth, and for no society, as he said, can exist long without it as the moral and spiritual background, background of a nation. And that's why Jesus spoke that long ago on the Sermon on the Mount. Unfortunately, as sinners, we don't really value truth as they did in his day or in our day above all else because we live in a sin and fallen world that has a corrupt and deceptive society all around us that operates mainly without truth. You know, the psalmist said in Psalm 58, verse 3, Even from birth the wicked go astray, from the womb, the wayward, spreading lies. The psalmist goes on to say in 62 verse 4, They take the light in lies, and with their mouths they bless, but in their hearts they curse. Even Jeremiah, he loved his people and uh, so much that he wished when he had tears that he shed for them that uh, they would have turned away from the spiritual depravity and deceitfulness that they lived in. And their spiritual adultery and living treachery repulsed him. And he wrote in Psalm, not Psalm, Jeremiah 9, verses 3 to 5, They make ready their tongue like a bow to shoot lies. It is not by truth that they triumph in the land. They go from one sin to another. They do not acknowledge me. And he goes on to say, declares the Lord, 
Beware of your friends. Do not trust anyone in your clan, for every one of them is a deceiver, and every friend a slanderer. Friends deceive friends, and no one speaks the truth. They have taught their tongues to lie. They weary themselves with sinning. Now let's be honest, today it seems the same thing. Lying is commonplace, especially with our nation's leaders. And in every area of communication, particularly in advertising, think about that, we find truthfulness is a rare gem uh, for us. And all of it is filled with the glory of lying, uh, dishonest words, representations, and evil and uh, let's get my words out, evil and cor corrupt and profane speech as well. Proverbs 23, 23 says, buy the truth and do not sell it. Get wisdom and discipline and understanding. So, truth, indeed, in Jesus' day was a rare commodity, but it still is with us today. So we're going to look at three things today. The principle of truth in the Mosaic Law, the perversion of truth in the Messiah's day, and the pattern of truth for our modern today. So, let's begin with verse 33. Jesus said, Again you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, Do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows that you have made. There's that phrase, Again you have heard that it was said, and now he says to the people long ago. What was he referring to? He was referring to the law and the writings of Moses long ago. And they had heard it interpreted by the Pharisees for them. So the Lord declares his utmost regard for Moses and the law. And now he proceeds to how to show that the law's truth and intent went far beyond the superficial writings or explanations of the scribes and the Pharisees of that day. Now, Jesus did not quote any particular verse from the Old Testament, but what he did was he took the entire concepts of what he was going to share on the Sermon on the Mount, and he summed them up in Old Testament teachings on the subject of oaths and vows and truthfulness. And, of course, this all brings us back to the Ten Commandments, particularly the Third Commandment. Think about that there. Exodus 20, verse 7. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. That's the New International Version, the King James. Of course, in New American Standard says, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. This phrase, in vain, has been translated misuse. It's a Hebrew word that means to falsify something, to use it in a false manner. That's what it means to take the name of the Lord in vain. Leviticus says it too. Do not swear falsely by my name, and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. Numbers 30, verse 2. When a man makes a vow to the Lord, or takes an oath to obligate himself by a pledge, he must not break his word, but he must do everything that he said. So the truth is the principle of God, and who God is as the Creator. And Moses also continued and spoke through Solomon, of course. But in the book of Deuteronomy, he wrote these things. If you make a vow to the Lord your God, do not be slow to pay it. For the Lord your God will certainly demand it of you, and you will be guilty of sin. Proverbs 6.16 These are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. Verse 17 Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, a false witness who pours out lies, and a person who stirs up conflict in the community. These, again, are the teachings of Jesus summarized as a composite when he spoke to the people of his day. And basically, you could put it together in two particular things, two types of vows and oaths that Jesus was referring to that were forbidden. Do you know what they were? Very simply, here they are. Number one, simply making false vows. Numbers 30, verse 22 tells us, When a man makes a vow to the Lord and takes an oath to obligate himself by a pledge, what must he do? He must not break his word, or he must accomplish or do or perform everything he said. So, Jesus was saying, if you make a vow, if you make a promise, and you say to someone, you better keep your word, because if you don't, you'll be sinning against God. 
Number two, not only making false vows, making frivolous vows. Leviticus 19.12, don't swear falsely by my name and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. Don't use exclamations uh, and make vows to God that have no meaning and bearing on truth or truthfulness here. Now, with that said, there's a lot of misunderstandings about taking oaths and, of course, swearing. And uh, we're going to see today and clarify that as well. So, God's name is misused when we utter to affirm our words falsely or frivolously in the process. Now, does that mean that we are never to make an oath or a vow? Jesus said, make no vows at all. There are some people who believe that. But if you believe that, you have to deny what the scripture has to say. And here's what I mean. God did allow and God did provide for making oaths in his name. He simply said, I don't want oaths or made in my name falsely, for I am the Lord. I am the God of truth. And I expect you to be people of truth as well. So there's the key. Making oaths in the name of the Lord is not wrong, but to make it falsely or frivolously is. Now, how do we know that? Well, if you go through the whole Old Testament, you'll discover that many good, godly men took oaths in the name of the Lord, and God didn't chide them for it. For instance, Abraham affirmed the fact that he, his promises to the king of Sodom in God's name would be carried out. Genesis 14, 22-24. Eliezer, Abraham's servant, took an oath in God's name that he would obey uh, uh, Abraham's uh, request to find a bride for his son. And then Isaac made a vow in God's name to King Abimelech as well in Genesis 26, 31. Then you go through more in the Bible, you'll discover that David and Jonathan swore an oath together in God's name, 1 Samuel 20, verse 16. And David himself particularly swore an oath to the Lord in his name in Psalm 132, verse 2. So all these good godly men took oaths in the name of the Lord. But if that doesn't help you to understand that taking an oath itself is not wrong, how about God himself taking an oath? That's right, most impressive. God took an oath in his own name on certain occasions, two times. Genesis 22, 16 to 17, and Hebrews 6, 13 to 14. God simply affirmed that by no one greater than himself, what he promised would come true. So in the Old Testament, it was not wrong to swear uh, an oath or take a vow. But if you were going to take a vow, you were to do it sparingly, and that was an important factor there. So the Jews of Jesus' day, they knew this important truth, but they taught, they were taught by their spiritual leaders something that was far different from this, because they abused as their leaders did and found ways to get around their oaths and their swearing that they made when it was convenient for them. And this is why Jesus went further. And if we go to chapter 23, verse 6, take a look and we'll see exactly what it said. It says, Woe to you blind guides! You say if anyone swears by the temple, it means nothing. Ah, but anyone who swears by the gold of the temple is bound by that oath. You see here, uh, they came up with an elaborate means of falsifying vows and oaths that they would make to deceive people to think that they would have to meet them. And they didn't. So if they swore by the temple, they didn't have to keep their oath. But if they swore by the gold of the temple, then they were bound by their oath. Nothing like that was in the Bible. They made that up. And they were phony. So Jesus tells them that they were blind guides trying to guide the people in the process here. So Jesus' point, of, point was that people should always tell the truth even when it hurts, and even when it's going to cost you something. And he hotly condemned the Jewish leaders for mishandling the scriptures. Now this brings us now to learn how Jesus uh, spoke of how the Jews had corrupted taking oaths and the importance of speaking truth. This is number two, the perversion of truth in the Messiah's day. Look at verse 34. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, Jesus said. Don't swear by heaven, for it's God's throne. Don't swear by the earth, for it is his footstool. Don't swear by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And don't swear by your head, for you cannot even make one hair white or black. 
Well, today we can dye hair and make white hair black, but in that day, they didn't and couldn't do it in the sense of making it real. Neither can we today. Gray hair is still gray hair. We can make it black by dye, but nothing more than that. So the Pharisees were notorious in that day for fabricating these elaborate schemes of deceit using them in carefully crafted and contrived oaths and affirmation and swearing to benefit them when necessary and to conceal and to hide the true intentions of their dishonored, untruthful heart. And the Pharisees were notorious for their oaths, which were made at the least provocation they would swear something. They made allowances for their mental reservations that they were not going to carry out at all. And that, of course, just revealed their corrupt heart and uh, everything that they could think of to deceive in speech. Christ condemned it. Now, the Jewish leaders of Jesus' day uh, established as long as you didn't swear directly by God's name, your oaths didn't have to be binding upon you. You could change your mind, even though you made a promise to someone, and you can enforce your belief through lying words. They swore by their life, they swore by their head, they swore by Jerusalem, uh, they swore by heaven and earth. All these things Jesus was saying, even if you didn't use God's name, you were swearing by God because God owned all those things. It was still by God that you were taking an oath. It was incredible distinctions that they had. Swearing by Jerusalem was not binding. Swearing towards Jerusalem was. Swearing by the gold in the temple was binding. But just swearing by the temple was not. All of these various things. How convenient to use words to deceive people. Of course, we don't have things like that today, do we? Anywhere? If you like your doctor or health care plan, <laughs> you can keep it. If you like your doctor, you can keep your doctor. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't know how that snuck in. <laughs> but you know, that was an outright lie. And he even admitted it later on, that he knew at that particular time that was an absolute falsehood about the Obamacare that they wanted to promote. But they needed to tell the people that so they wouldn't stand against it. But you see, this is what we have. The Pharisees used uh, dishonesty because it benefited them for what they were going to say. So Jesus, of course, condemned these various things. And he said, I tell you, do not swear an oath at all. Don't swear by heaven thinking that it's not binding upon you because heaven is God's throne. Don't swear by the earth around you because heaven is his footstool. Don't swear by the great city of Jerusalem because it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. I haven't even tried, by the way. But the <laughs> important thing is, that is the truth. Even the swear by this involves God, because he is the creator of all. And so Jesus said that. I tell you, don't swear at all, either by heaven, by earth, by Jerusalem, and don't swear by your head. Why? Because this comes from the evil one. Jesus said later on in John 8, 44, he said, Satan is the father of lies. And he spoke about the Pharisees, and you are his children. They were liars from one end to another. So this dishonesty clause that the Pharisees had invented here uh, was very helpful for them. And it succeeded momentarily in evading people from the truth. So this brings us to the third thing, the pattern of truth for a modern day. Look at verse 37. All you need to say, Jesus said, with your conversation and your speech is simply yes. Why? Or simply no. Because people should trust you. And people will trust you if they discover that everything you say is truth. They have never discovered you deceiving them or lying to them. People will believe you. But now those who very often deceive people and lie to them, they always have to affirm what they have to say uh, with some exclamation, like, I swear to God, or, you know, I'm my mother's grave, or something like that, because they know you're not going to believe them. So Jesus said, make this a part of your life to please God, that you are an honest and a truthful person. 
William Barclay, a great uh, commentator and theologian, wrote this about this passage of Scripture, and I want to read to you from his New Testament commentary. Here is a great eternal truth. Life cannot be divided into compartments in some in which God is involved and others which he is not involved. There cannot be one kind of language or speech in the church and another kind in the shipyard or the factory or the office or the home. There cannot be one kind of standard of conduct in the church and another kind of standard in the business world. The fact is that God does not need to be invited into certain departments of your life and kept out of others. He is everywhere, all through life and every activity of life. God hears not only the words which are spoken in his name, he hears all words, and there cannot be any such thing as a form of words which evade bringing God into the transaction. So therefore, Barclay writes, all speech, all oaths, all promises are sacred, remembering that all are made in the presence of God, who is the God of truth. You know, later Jesus said that very thing too. All speech is sacred. It must be based absolutely on truth and honesty. Matthew 12, verse 37. By your words, Jesus said, you will be acquitted. And by your words, you will be condemned. If you've told a lie, if you've deceived people with your words or any form of your communication, God says at the judgment seat, you will receive condemnation. Now, of course, if you confess your sins... The Bible says he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. But God wants more than us to just confess it. I'll never forget in one church setting, there was a couple of people there who planned on doing something that was not biblical. But they thought it would be good for the church. And so they were overheard saying, well, let's just do this even though it's wrong. And when it's found out, we'll just confess it. Think about that. There are people who think that I can do wrong and then go confess it. Well, if you're going to do wrong in the basis of confessing it, you're not going to be forgiven those sins. Because God knew all about it. And the fact is that you were trying to deceive God. You cannot deceive God. A half-truth is a whole lie. Think about that. A white lie, people try to say, oh, well, this is a white lie. A white lie is as black as coal. So God has never had any standard lower than absolute truthfulness. And it is never right to lie. Think about that. Put that in your own pipe and smoke it, as they say. It is never right to lie. Now you might say, ooh, well, aren't there sometimes the right to lie? I'll get into that in a while. But Psalm 51 verse 6 from the New Living Translation says, You, God, desire, desire honesty from the heart, so teach me to be wise in my inmost being. How important it is. So the pattern for a modern day is watch your words, be careful what you say. Jesus said, everything you are saying and speaking of is being recorded. Think about that. At the judgment seat of Christ, everything that is not confessed sincerely and repented of, everything there that you have said or spoken or done that has been dishonest and untruthful will be brought to light at that particular time. Because it's all recorded. And guess where it's recorded? Right here in my mind and heart that goes along with my soul and spirit. When I die, my soul and spirit goes to heaven and the recording of my life as well. And the recording of your life too. Now, this brings us to ask, what about the fact that Jesus said, make no oath at all? Did he mean that? No, that was a euphemism in a sense here that he was saying, importantly enough, don't you dare make any use, uh, oaths or vows, except that which is absolutely necessary. And again, how do we know those things? Well, we're going to see that in a minute because even Jesus took an oath in the New Testament. Even the Apostle Paul took an oath and God did not chide him for that as well. But there it is. Do not swear an oath at all. Now, in uh, oath-taking in the Old Testament, we have already shown that there were many great men and God himself who took an oath, and he was pleased with that. But in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul takes an oath in God's name in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 23. And then again in Galatians chapter 1, verse 20. And he was not rebuked for that very thing. But I'm going to give you a scripture here because even Jesus took an oath. And guess what the oath was? 
his oath was affirming before Caiaphas, the high priest, that he was the Christ, that he was the Son of God who has come in the flesh. Now when people say, oh Jesus never claimed to be God, oh yes he did and he took an oath for it. Take a look, Matthew 26 verses 63 to 64, Jesus remained silent. And then the high priest said to him, I demand in the name of the living God, he's demanded by oath, tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Did Jesus remain silent? No, he didn't. He confirmed and he said, you have said it. Absolutely right, in the name of the living God. And in the future you will see the Son of Man seated in the place of power at God's right hand and coming on the clouds of heaven. So we see that even Jesus took a vow, as we see right here. So the answer is, Jesus taught, don't make oaths and don't take vows frivolously or falsely, or even uh, frequently, let's add that. So oath-taking today may be necessary, but only under certain situations. What kind of situations is it proper to take oaths? Well, obviously taking an oath in court proceedings is not wrong today. Oaths are very necessary on other important occasions. Maybe making a serious deposition. Maybe signing a contract of some sort. But they're only to be given in the name of God and not in someone else or something else as well. So we must never swear at taking an oath by anything other than God's holy name. And then under the most dire and only necessary important situations where it's vital for life and living and for others to understand. Jesus said, let your words be yes, or let your words be no. And therefore, as I said a moment ago, uh, these uh, exclamations people used to, gay, to use, and maybe you use them, just be careful about them. Honest to God, cross my heart and hope to die. I swear to God, or something on my mother's grave, or etc., etc. Why are you using those expressions? You shouldn't be using them and shouldn't have to. They're sinful exclamations and embellishments in your speech that dishonor God. So, God commands his children to speak truth and be honest with all our words. Take a look here. Here's a couple of things from the Old Testament. Psalm 5, verse 6. You destroy those who tell lies. The bloodthirsty and deceitful, Lord, you detest. Proverbs 12, 19. Truthful lips endure forever, but a lying tongue lasts only a moment. Proverbs 24, verse 28. Do not testify against your neighbor without cause. Would you use your lips to mislead? Proverbs 12, 22. The Lord detests lying lips, but he delights in people who are trustworthy. And then the New Testament, Ephesians 4, verse 25. Therefore, each of you, Paul is speaking to all of us through the Holy Spirit, you must put off falsehood, that is lying, and speak truthfully. Well, there you have it. From cover to cover. The Bible commands God's children to speak truth and to be known for truthfulness. However, what do we do in situations where telling the truth for the moment is going to be harmful? You might say, how can that be? Yes, it can at times where something. It could alter the course or action of someone else to make a wrong decision because that truth that you gave wasn't fully based on fact. Sometimes what you might think is truth is only opinion. And we saw this in the uh, terrorism in San Bernardino. Immediately, for the first five hours, people were giving us facts, things that were absolute opinion and were false. And they could cause other people to work or carry out another act because it was based on falsehood. So the point is, we have to always speak the truth. But we don't have to always speak all the truth. If you come up to me and ask how things are, I don't have to tell you about the carbuncle on my uh, whatever, right? I don't have to tell you about this in my body or anything like that. Those are personal things that uh, you might say, I don't need to hear all that truth, right? Well, that's exactly what I'm trying to say in, in an illustration form here. Just give the truth that's relevant and necessary and will be helpful uh, for a situation. And when you do that, it's fine. Maybe later on you can share other things about that, but wait before you do that. The point is, nothing should come from our lips that would be deceitfulness or dishonest. Let's face the fact, when the telephone rings 
and there's someone on the line that you don't want to speak to, don't tell your spouse to say, oh, she's not here. Oh, he's not here. How are you going to answer that? Sometimes we do it deceitfully. We run outside the house and stand out the door and tell the person, oh, they're not here right now. Well, that might be true, but isn't that deceitful? It's very deceitful. So maybe we have to suck it up and answer the phone, yeah. whatever it is. So maybe you'll find a way to do these things without lying in the process there. So the point is, be careful about maintaining in every situation honesty and truthfulness. And that really is important. Daniel Webster said this, There is nothing so powerful as truth, and often nothing as strange. And that is so true. So let's apply these things, because I don't want to go any further through this. We have more to see you in Jesus' words next week. But here we go. Every word we speak must be what? Honest and true, and not purposely lead others into deceptive or untrue thoughts or beliefs. Number two. Our words should be consistently trustworthy, so others will believe us just because we speak and have no need of swearing or exclamation to affirm them. You know, I haven't utilized this concept, but Jesus' words of speaking truth and, and honesty also speak about a lying tongue and a profane tongue. Profanity should never come forth from a Christian and a believer. Number three. In this light, how honest is your speech? I can't evaluate you, but you can evaluate yourself. Are your words and vows meaningful or meaningless to others? Are your lips pure speech or what? Not peppered with profanity, coarse talk, <coughs> inappropriate speech, or speaking nonsense. Don't speak nonsense to people that you don't have any reality behind it because people won't believe anything you have to say as a result of that. So it's important, Jesus was teaching in our text the wrong use of our speech, particularly in taking oaths and vows, although at times it might be necessary to do that. So God help us to know and to use our tongue to glorify God. Someone said it well, the tongue is the billboard of our heart. What comes out of your heart will come out on your tongue. Remember God is a holy God, and his kingdom is a holy kingdom. And the people of the kingdom, you and I, are to be holy people as well. So hypocrisy, darkness, untruthfulness has to be cast out. And our words bathed in truth and faithful to keep them. James 5.12 says, Above all else, my brothers and sisters, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Anything else and you will be condemned. Well, I'll close on this. How is your tongue spiritually before the Lord? And in a real sense here, figuratively speaking, so you don't stick it out at me, stick out your tongue right now before God and let Him examine it. How truthful has it been? And if it hasn't been truthful, confess that as we go to the Supper of the Lord and ask Him for cleansing and to make you a person of honesty and truthfulness like the Lord himself. And then ask him what he wants you to do with that truthfulness. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the value of truth that Jesus has shown us. And I pray that each and every one of us here, we might indeed be men and women of truth. And if there's been any areas of our lives where we've been dishonest and deceitful, and we have led people down a wrong path, help us to go to those people and confess that. Or in every, whatever way something stands that's not true, uh, make it true in some way or fashion. And let us walk forward from here in all honesty and truthfulness. Now the greatest truth of all is that Jesus Christ is Lord and God and Savior. And when he stood before Caiaphas there, he did not distort the truth because it would have helped him avoid the cross. He indeed stood faithful and honest and took that oath that he was the living Son of God, that He was the Messiah, the Savior of the world, come to reach down and save lost sinners. Now, Father, I'm thankful that He saved me. I'm thankful that I saw who He was, and I reached out with my heart and confessed my sin of rejecting Him and called upon Him to become my Lord and Savior and my God for all eternity. And He came and saved me and my soul. And He's been remaking that soul and spirit all these years but yet 
that uh, remaking still needs to go on. And I know my brothers and sisters are the same way. Help us to be made further and fuller into the likeness of Jesus Christ. And for those who don't know him, may today be the day they call upon him to save them from their sins. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.